Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited for today's interview. We are talking to a very well-loved six-figure author who's known for writing his supernatural thrillers, kind of like a Deadpool cross the Punisher. Now I'm intrigued. We're talking to the one and only Hunter Blaine. How are you today? Hey, everyone. I'm doing pretty awesome. And we were uh, just discussing that you're on the, the tail end of finishing book nine. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, I just wrote the end last night. But uh, now I need to go back and uh, fill in some chapters. Now that I know exactly how the book is going to end, uh, I want to uh, tie it all together nice and neat. Yeah, your readers are going to love. This is going to be music to their ears. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they, they uh, message me a lot. <laughs> so tell me then about the start of your writing journey. What got you into writing in the first place and how did you find publishing your first book? So... Um, uh, a lot of people already uh, know this, um, but for anyone who's new, um, the series is actually written uh, about and for my best friend, John Cook. That's him right there. Um, we grew up together. He always enjoyed my writing um, and we just grew up and shaped each other's lives. And, um, uh, you know, he was, he was my bromigo. And uh, one day he, he made me promise to write a book about him, which for him, you know, he's, you know, we're men, right? So for him to be like, hey, man, can you do this thing for me? You know, it, it was it's pretty touching. And I, I remember it. So I was like, hey, hell yeah, dude, what do you want to be? And, you know, we grew up reading like Anne Rice and stuff uh, and love the Vampire Chronicles. So he's like, I want to be a vampire, but not one of those sparkly ones. I was like, I got you, man. And then I didn't think anything of it. And then in uh, 2014, I got a phone call uh, from my mother that uh, he had gotten in a bad car accident and didn't make it. So uh, yeah, that sucked. And then, um, you know, that, that took a long time. It still processes even all this time later, but um, it took some time. And then one day I, was, I had a nutrition store located inside of a gym. So one day I was just sitting up there and I opened up my laptop and I just started writing. And I already knew what the, gla uh, the title was gonna be, which is I'm Glad You're Dead, which is a, uh, a weird thing to write about your best friend being dead, right? But it's actually a, a quote from the 1989 Batman where Joker says that to someone over and over and over. So that was actually uh, John and I spoke in movie quotes. And that was the thing we would say all the time is, you know, I'm glad you're dead. And then it was just so it made sense. Plus, he's a vampire, so he's undead and he had to die to become a vampire. So it worked on multiple levels. So um, I wrote it and I'd never written anything in earnest before, short stories here and there, nothing published, nothing submitted, uh, just creative arts uh, or creative writing in high school. And my teacher, you know, pulled me aside one day and said, I, I should really look into it. But, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I was high school, right? So uh, I thought I was gonna be a millionaire as soon as I walked out the door and, <laughs> you know, and, and didn't know there's a real world out there. But um, I wrote it, finished it, and I loved it. Because uh, I wrote it just for me. That's another thing that's important to note is um, the book is full of uh, um, our humor, a lot of our quotes that we'd say back and forth to one another, um, and uh, um, uh, very, very obscure movie references, such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, John says in his best Bob Peck, clever girl. And most people are like, who the hell's Bob Peck? Or I mean, most my generation. Uh, Bob Peck is a very accomplished actor who was the uh, uh, the hunter uh, or the raptor uh, keeper in Jurassic Park. So his last words were "clever girl." So we would always say "clever girl." And but uh, anyway, um, I wrote book one just for me, no one else in mind, and I gave it to you know our, our circle of best friends like uh, Dustin Valenta, who's in the books, uh, Jonathan Depwig, who's in the books, um, Richard, who's in the book, like. All of our friends knew I was writing a book and they wanted to be a part of this eulogy and play their part. And I asked them what they wanted to be. Like Depp Boyk wanted to be a werewolf. So I was like, cool, man, vampire and a werewolf, best friends, let's go for it. And then uh, I gave it to them. And I remember it was uh, Dustin Valenta told me, uh, he read it and he said, dude, I was going to tell you it was good no matter what, because you're my bro, but seriously, this is good. You need to do something with it. And then I thought, uh, oh, well, I mean, if he's saying that, it must mean something. So then... Um, I went about discovering how to independently publish and, uh, luckily Amazon is very friendly nowadays to independent publishers. They'll let you publish basically whatever you want. And then it's up to you from there. So I, um, I hired editors, several, and 
all of them sucked except for the one that I found. Uh, all of them sucked to the point that I actually, um, I did something called the editor games where I hired five editors and had them uh, edit my novella, which is 12,000 words. And I paid them the full, full fees and told them you're competing against four others. And the winner gets to do the rest of the series. So um, uh, Fabiola was the one who, who won and she caught something that I should have known, which is uh, the novella takes place in 1990. And I mentioned jo one of John's favorite metal bands, uh, Demi Bourdieu. And he's like, uh, she, she pointed out, hey, they weren't formed until 92. And I'm like, there's no way you should have known that. And I should have known that you win. And she's just been so helpful. But, uh, you know, did the, got the artwork, um, reached out to a bunch of people and then eventually just put it up myself. And, and, and that was kind of that. That's amazing. And I absolutely love to, when I was stalking you a little bit, just a little bit, um, I loved reading about um, about your friend and how you started writing because you've done it in a very witty way in your bio, but it immediately is heartwarming and takes you into the world that you've created. I thought it was very clever where people would usually use that space to basically, um, you know, this is what I've achieved and this and that. You straight away are storytelling and how it's molded you not only as a person, but your story and writing. I absolutely loved it and it's beautiful to hear that story. Um, so we're now up to book nine then. Did you mm -hmm. think that this would turn into what it was and how have you sort of continued on with the series? So yes and no. When I started, I, uh, John's favorite number was always 13. It could have been because Friday the 13th. It could have been because, you know, scary, scary number, or whatever. You know, it was just a good number to have as a, as a favorite number, I suppose. You know, the taboo number. So I said, all right, this is going to be 13 books. And then in book one, I already knew the ending, uh, which is I can't wait because not a single person has seen it coming yet and no one will. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, I knew the ending and I knew the twists and turns, but I didn't know the road to. I didn't know that there was going to be traffic along the way and detours and all this stuff. But I knew the beginning and I knew the end. And I knew it was going to be 13 uh, and I never thought anything. I thought it was just going to be something I did on the side, like on weekends, just for me, you know, just because um, I, I really enjoy reading and I wanted to write something that I wanted to read. And that's very important for me is everything I write is not for anyone else but me. Uh, fans are, uh, uh, and readers are, are more than uh, encouraged to come along, but I don't put anything in a story thinking like, oh, the reader's going to love this or um, oh, this is a hot topic nowadays. Let's make sure that, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's uh, I, I do because I, I read what I want to read and, and, and that's that. Yeah. So if you had to summarize Preternatural Chronicles in a couple of sentences for those who haven't yet read it, which they should, let's go on and with <laughs> the other people. How would you how would you pitch it? So it starts off with um, a vampire uh, or a human. Uh, watches his family murdered before him and a vampire comes and offers him the chance at uh, vengeance basically and uh, you know in his grief and his rage he accepts and then they spend all this time trying to hunt down his killers and so forth and then uh, after a while um, uh, John decides that he would rather be more of a, a good he, he doesn't feel like what he's doing is right and um, and he thinks he's a throwing tar on his soul and you know it, it comes to the book one uh, uh where he it's actually the novella which takes place in 1990 where he uh, meets up with uh, father thomas filsey and the uh, the priest has heard about him a vampire who wants to use his powers for good and so a vampire wants to break the mold and not be a bad guy anymore. He's an anti-hero, don't get me wrong. When he kills bad guys, you know, he's, it's very Deadpool-ish or Punisher-ish. So uh, I like that. But to break it down, uh, I have, the, the short one is Deadpool as a vampire. The elevator pitch is a priest, a vampire, and the apocalypse walk into a bar. So it turns out uh, that John is the center of a prophecy wherein the last vampire on earth when the last vampire walks the earth, the gates of hell will open. And so he tries his damnedest to stay out of it. And the more he tries to stay out of it, the more he's pulled in. And uh, 
one thing that my readers uh, seem to have a consensus on, and I completely agree with, is the series feels real, first of all, because uh, even though it's vampires and werewolves and stuff, um, because there's consequences to decisions and actions and inactions. Inaction is, is an action. So consequences. So a lot of my readers are afraid to turn the page similar to George R.R. R. Martin because you don't know what's gonna happen because consequences are real. So uh, yeah, but to summarize, it's um, uh, a priest, a vampire and the apocalypse walk into a bar. That is a good pitch. I love that. <laughs> what does your writing process look like? And are you a plotter? Are you a pantser? Do you work nine to five? What's the, what's the process? So um, Shane Silver's got me into Scrivener and I do use the corkboard feature, but I didn't start using that until book six or seven, book six, whenever I started planning more detailed or really it's not about planning. It's more about I left myself notes. Hey, remember you left this breadcrumb because I want to go back through and make sure that uh, at the end of the series that I didn't leave any breadcrumbs, uh, you know, uh, uh, left out. So I know the beginning. I know the climax and I know the conclusion. So the beginning, the middle and the end. I don't know how to get there in between. So I actually, um, fun story. I have a journal, which one day I'm going to auction off uh, when I'm, you know, making movies and stuff. Yep. <laughs> delusions of grandeur but um where i wrote every single chapter uh of book one because uh, uh jim butcher i watched a lot of his uh, interviews on writing uh workshops same thing with brandon sanderson those guys are huge planners huge planners uh jim butcher it's scene sequel scene sequel scene sequel scene sequel does he get what he wants yes or no it's usually no you know, why not you know that kind of thing so i planned out the entirety of book one and as I started writing it, John went off and did whatever the hell he wanted to do. And I was like, hey, what do you, all right. And then, so now I just watch what they do. That's awesome. And have you sort of thought about afterwards, obviously this is going to be a 13 book series. Is your mind wandering elsewhere already on different series or different spin-offs, or you are very in this game until the end and, and figure it out afterwards? A little bit of both. Um, <laughs> So I know what's going to happen after the series. Um, no one else does, except for Shane. It's going to become a movie. It's a movie. <laughs> uh, well, I, there, there could be something in the works uh, eventually. Uh, right now, Shane, which I think you're, did you do your interview or is he coming up? Um, he's uh, in two days. So he's All right, make sure to Make sure to ask him about uh, Sucker Punch Studios, okay. which is a preliminary name. So uh, after he does his stuff, then I should be next in line. Or, you know, he, he's got a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but once he lays the groundwork, he can, he's got a, several avenues that he could take. So yeah, there will be, I, I, I know there'll be a show or a movie one day, hopefully it'll be a show like on HBO or something uh, or who flicks as I like to say in the books. I almost called that. I said Hulu and Netflix were gonna combine, but it was Hulu and Disney. So instead of who flicks, it's who dis. So I missed that one. There's a lot of predictions that have come true in my books, like uh, electric hummers and all that other stuff. Because part of there's a there's a jump at one period of uh, of some years. So that that's actually a lot of fun. But um, I I don't want to distract from this story, but I do know what's happening after. Um, and I put little dots here and there that doesn't distract from the main story of the book or the series but they're there and no one has caught it yet. And that's exactly what I want. So whenever uh, I have a next series planned in this uh, universe, but who knows who's gonna make it, who knows what's gonna happen, who are, you know, the consequences of all these actions. So uh, you'll have to read it and find out. So but readers will be happy. I think so. I think they're probably watching this going, damn it, I know he's doing so. I know, but I haven't found it yet. They're probably so. Mm -hmm. Happily frustrated. Um, <laughs> speaking of Shane Silvers, then you um, go through his publishing company, which is mm -hmm. Argento Publishing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, awesome. So, how how did you meet Shane Silvers? How did that come about? So I owe uh, all that to to Paige. Mm -hmm. She um, she found me um, after I published book three, um, and she reached out to me. And she, she was like, uh, hey, man, why is book one and book two on Kindle Unlimited, but book three isn't? You know, that's kind of a bait and switch thing. 
I'm like, well, book three was twice the size and cost me a whole lot more money. So I need to make some of it back. And she's like, uh, look, this is what you need to do. You need to do kind of limit. This is what Shane Silvers does. He does it in this order. He does it this way. And he's a millionaire. So I was like, oh, well, I'm really good at taking advice from people who know more than me. If you tell me that stove's hot, I don't need to touch it to know that it's hot, uh, which is a, a, a great asset that's helped me throughout life. Very much so. If you know more than me, you tell me something. I, it's it's as if I lived that experience. So that's great. So she told me all these things and I did what she said. And then she introduced me to Shane and then Shane and I bantered back and forth on his page. He got some readers my way. And then um, uh, after a while, it was just before book five came out. Yeah, just before book five came out. I had a, a, someone reach out uh, wanting me to talk to their publishing company. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, uh, you know, I was excited, of course. And um, uh, I almost went with them too, except there was one big hook, hiccup about the uh, expenses and related to the narrator. Um, they didn't, it, it came down to basically, uh, um, Luke Daniels is a ha- Hall of Fame narrator. And if you want, um, Ryan Reynolds to star in your movie, you're going to pay Ryan Reynolds price or, you know, the rock or whoever's hot at the moment. Right. So uh, if you want the best, you pay for the best. And I was not willing to negotiate. I spent a lot of my own money hiring Luke and it was the best decision I ever did because he brings with it his own readers. So it came down to um, they weren't willing to pay his salary basically or his fees. And so I actually reached out to Shane uh, knowing what I was doing and was like, hey, man, can I get your advice on something? And then I showed him, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I have uh, one or two companies trying to uh, sign me over. And, you know, I have some concerns. He's like, wait, don't do anything. And then like the next day he got back to me, he's like, oh, we want you to sign with us. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, we talked, we negotiated, uh, you know, I had my lawyer, they had their lawyers and stuff. It was, it was a real adult moment. And um, they were very compensating. You know, they, they agreed to some of the things that was really important to me. Um, um, and, uh, they also agreed Shane and Lane agreed. They were like, Hey, Luke was like the smartest thing you you could have done. And we fully support that. And, uh, yeah, we're going to pay his fees because you're obviously doing really good and audible. So I was like, well, I mean, that's that, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I signed with them just because they agreed, uh, well that, and I already knew Shane was successful and, you know, he was, uh, and Paige talked really good about him. John Logston, I talked to him and he was like, uh, uh, yeah, Shane is a great guy. I trust him completely. Um, uh, you'd be making the smartest move of your life. And, you know, so far it was. So yeah. that, that's how that all went about is I had at the same time, you know, people reach out to me trying to, you know, sign me, which is really cool because for those of you out there who are writers, um, I went through, I use Fiverr and I paid people to write a query letter for me um, based on what real agents and publishing companies were looking for, right? You have to do it in very specific ways, uh, very timely ways. And then um, uh, I even paid someone else who gave me a list of all these agents and publishers who deal with urban fantasy specifically. And uh, let's say I sent out the query letter to a hundred people. I spent weeks because each one of them, okay, we want you to send a manuscript, but it has to be this margin, has to be this font, has to be this spacing. What they're really trying to do to see if you can follow direction. So I did exactly what they wanted because I'm pretty uh, computer literate. I'm good with that stuff. So I did exactly what they wanted. I got 99 no answers, or no, I got like 96 no answers, uh, three no's, and then one from Podium. I spoke to a really nice uh, lady there and she was like, no, but here's some advice. You should do this. You should um, create a website and get email addresses. You should give away your novella for free if they give you your email uh, address. So if you go to hunterplane.com, sign up for a newsletter, you get the novella ebook for free. And, uh, you know, she gave me all this advice and she said, okay, I want you to reach back out to me when you get to here. So, uh, but by the time I got to here, Shane was already like mine. And I was like, well, he wants it, you know, so I, I'm going to go with who wants to bring me on versus me trying to convince someone to bring me on. And um, yeah, it was just crazy. So for those of you out there, uh, you're going to hear nothing or you're going to hear no uh, a lot. And then clearly those people are wrong and uh, it's not their fault either. They get a thousand submissions or probably literally a hundred submissions a day that they have to read and they have to make snap judgments and so forth. So I think what really caught Shane's attention was the fact that we were bantering back and forth in his group 
and we were grilling each other and it was really comedic, but not, not crossing a line. So it's, you know, it's kind of difficult to do and it's playful. And this, and uh, he was like, okay, this guy gets it. And then he started reading book one. And then uh, he said there was one uh, joke in there that, that caught his eye that it was kind of risky. Um, I, I'll just say what it is. I don't, I don't even care, but it was um, uh, John's walking through this neighborhood in Houston and he says it's a hashtag white people locking car doors part of town, but he loves it. And Shane was like, okay, this guy is not afraid to make some, uh, some jokes and, you know, not be offensive about it, but be funny. You know, it's kind of like in a National Lampoon's, you know, like roll them up, you know, that kind of thing. It was very akin to that. And he's like, I, this guy gets it. So after that, you know, uh, it was, the, the, I guess the rest is history. Yeah, it was a bromance after that. <laughs> yes. Yes, he's a really cool dude. I'm very lucky. So I've taken a lot of things out of that. But one is too, when you are looking at signing up, especially to small presses, um, it's important that you have that chemistry. I want to say that chemistry with the person because if you need to have a close-knit relationship, and I kind of sometimes like that a bit more than if you do go with a bit uh, a bigger publisher, so to speak, they don't necessarily has, have as much time for you. They don't know exactly who you are, and you really want to make sure that even if you've had a lot of no's and then suddenly you get a yes, that you're really thinking about it, whether they're a right match for you. Because I know a lot of people, and I've personally done the same thing in previous years on smaller contracts, I've gone, this looks great, yep, done. And I didn't really think it through as to how it might affect me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people do that because they're so relieved to finally hear a yes that they don't think about how the matchup looks. So sometimes it's better to say no if you don't feel like it's the right step because something big is coming along sometimes. Or get a lawyer and negotiate too. And yeah. if they don't agree to the things that are really, really important to you, then what are they not going to agree to later on? Yep. Oh, I love that. Yes. Now, speaking about audiobooks too, which we touch base on a little bit, um, how did you find the process on creating your first one? Because I know it can be quite intimidating for a lot of people. So um, not, it wasn't intimidating for me. I can understand it though. Um, I'm, I have the opposite of imposter syndrome. You know, for those of you who don't know, imposter syndrome is why do these people like me? I'm not good enough. Um, I shouldn't be here. You know, oh, I don't know. You know, that kind of thing, even though they're extremely talented. Um, one of my favorite guitarists from uh, uh, Dean Lamb from uh, Archspire was actually talking about how he got over imposter syndrome because he's a crazy, crazy good technical guitarist, like crazy good. And he went on to talk about how, you know, uh, um, uh, he had to realize that he is as good as the audience perceives him. So I have the opposite of that. Like I'm, I've always been overconfident. Everything I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to be the best at. And I usually am. Now there have been failures, but I learned from them. And that's the important thing. If you, uh, uh, if you learn, if you learn from a failure, then it's a lesson, not a mistake. Yeah. So fail forward. It's a good book, but I've always been uh, uh, really good in sales. And then it, I became a district and even regional manager for various companies such as GNC and Sears um, and so I'm used to hard work and crazy expectations and dealing with a thousand plus people and millions and millions of dollars and all this other stuff. So for me, you know, this aspect of things was a, a whole lot simpler, but for audiobooks, it actually comes back to, uh, I read a lot uh, of audiobooks. Uh, I can't read, uh, in traditional terms, uh, I can but it takes me, it took me a year to read it by Stephen King. And I actually tried, you know, it, it took me a whole year to read it versus some people can read it in a couple of days, more power to you. I don't know. I don't know how you do it, but uh, it takes me forever. So audiobooks was my, my, was my cure. So I put on all audiobooks at 1.5 speed and I used to travel for everything I've ever worked for. I would travel and uh, I read a lot of audiobooks and Luke Daniels with Iron Drew Chronicles, James Marsters, uh, James Marsters with the um, uh, Jim Butcher uh, Dresden, of course. Um, and then uh, R.C. Bray with pretty much anything that he did. Um, McLeod Andrews with Sandman Slim. Like there's just a bunch that I would just like, no matter what, I would buy their books. Uh, Ray Porter is also one of my favorites. Uh, one day I want him to read a book by me. Um, but I reached out to R.C. Bray and told him, you know, hey man, I get this the story. It's about my best friend, um, keeping a promise. Um, you actually sound like him with your awesome manly deep voice. Um, would you read my books? And he was like, well, how can I say no to that? 
So we were actually uh, talking back and forth. And first thing he had me do was change the cover because my old cover, let's see, I, I got one over here. Yeah, here's a, a whole little history. So this was the cover of book one. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's Batman, the animated series, basically, where Batman's standing on the building and uh, there's lightning in the background and it's all chest puffed out. And then R.C. Bray was like, hey, man, I hate to tell you, you know, uh, that, you know, that people actually do judge a book by its cover. You need to change it. So I was like, oh, OK, cool. And once again, I learned from people giving me advice. So I actually found someone to take. This is the second edition of book one. Uh, that's actually John's real face um put on like the body and the and it's it's very similar you know there's lightning there's the buildings and um yeah that was just really really cool the only problem is john and i weren't big picture people I, i'm still not i try to force myself to take pictures um for reasons like this you know to remember so he's kind of a little bit blurry not crystal clear and every book you know he's making the same face because i only have a handful of pictures so then uh, uh, Shane and Lane came along and they actually had me change it to this one, you know, much more eye catching, uh, high definition because it was taken recently by professional cameras and, you know, all that stuff. But um, RC Bray told me, you got to change your cover and uh, you need to make your books 10 hours long. Um, so it's 100,000 words. They got to be 10 hours long. Otherwise, people are going to be hesitant to spend their $15 audible credit on it. So I was like, OK, so then I got to work and uh we were negotiating back and forth, talking about when this, when that. Then all of a sudden, he got a contract with Podium, and then boom, he was contractually booked up for two years. So then he was like, "Hey, man, uh, you know, I, I hate to. I think what were what was his exact phrase? I hate to rip your nuts off." Which was, I was like, "I like this guy," <laughs> but uh, he said, "I hate to rip your nuts off, but I can't do it. Who else would you like?" I said, "Well, it has to, uh, in order." Um, Luke Daniels, um, I think it was McLeod Andrews, then James Marsters, because, you know, he was so associated with uh, Dresden and it was a currently uh, going series. I was like, I don't know if I really want James Marsters just because of the confusion, same, you know, type of books and all that. And then McLeod Andrews. So he's like, okay, this is how you reach out to them. Uh, he told me you go to acx.com. I reached out to Luke and McLeod. And uh, Luke got back to me and said, hell yeah, dude, that sounds awesome. Deadpool is a vampire to count me because he was done with Iron Druid. That's another reason I was like, you know, he's done. Now he can move on to the next urban fantasy series. And uh, and, and the rest is history. Uh, he did the novella and book one at the same time. And then um, he gave me the novella back. And because it was in Houston, you know, he gave John a thick Southern drawl up first. At first, I was like, okay, I want you to, dial it back to, to a two or three um, and then make the cadence more like Deadpool. Yeah. You know, I want you to imagine Deadpool with the inflections and the cadence and the, uh, and the comedic timing. And he was like, okay. And then he gave it back to me with the edits. And I was like, holy shit, that's it. That's done. So like, that was the only direction I had to give him uh, for, for John. And he just nailed it. Now he is, you know, the preternatural chronicles. I, I can't imagine anyone else reading the series. He is, Whenever I write, he is 95%, and I mean literally like 95%, what I hear in my head as I'm writing is how he delivers it. So it's a, we're, we're really simpatico, which is so fortunate. I never have to give him uh, very many notes at all. Uh, he never calls me or you know, says like, hey, I don't understand this or that. Can you, you know, explain it to me? You know, he gets it. And then again, you hire a professional, you get a professional. That's, yeah. that's how that is. So for those of you who are wondering how to get your book turned into an audiobook? go to ACX, so Alpha Charlie X-Ray.com, and that is a audible company. Loosely, they, they're companied together, but they really don't know what the other one's doing. I promise you that'll be annoying, but you'll deal with it. Um, and then you can hire people. You can reach out. I reached out to Luke directly. You can reach out to your favorite narrators directly. You can uh, do auditions. You can put up scripts. You can say, uh, it's going to be three different people. I want you to give me a script on this is the main character. This is their accent. This is this, this is that. And then they, you can have people audition and then choose someone and then negotiate the fees and all that other stuff uh, at the end of it. So it's actually pretty simple to do. It's just um, don't accept anything uh, except what makes you happy. So if someone 
I don't care if they're 50 bucks an hour or 1200 bucks an hour per finished book or per finished hour. If the $50 an hour one, you're like, wow, that's great. Just go with it. Like you'll be happy. So what would you say then so far your most challenging thing has been so far and your greatest accomplishment has been in your writing career? I'll start with the accomplishment and that's that. So Shane and Lane came down recently, like last month. Yeah. Beginning of, no, this month, beginning of this month, they drove down from Missouri um, and took me out to me and my wife out to a really nice steak dinner at a place I'd never even heard of. Uh, it's in my backyard. Basically it was really nice. Um, and they presented me with that award for crossing um, over six figures in sales for 2020. And that's with them signing me halfway through too. So that's actually, that's really cool. Um, Cause Lane is really good at the advertising stuff. So that was so far my biggest accomplishment. Um, and then second, what's the hardest part? All of it, but mostly dealing with Amazon and Facebook ads. Those are the most frustrating soul sucking thing in existence. Uh, dealing with the editors in the very beginning. Uh, here's another big piece of advice for you uh, aspiring writers out there. Pay the damn fee. If your editor is too cheap, there's a reason why. You know, you should be spending six, eight hundred thousand bucks to edit your book. And my editor does everything like start to finish, not just line editing, but continuity errors, you know, grammar, pacing. She is amazing. And every single book, she catches something that I should have been like, oh, my God. You know, like, hey, you said her hair was this color in this book. Why is it changed? I'm like, well, fix that real quick. You know, stupid stuff that I should have seen. Um, but then again, we see, you know, 100,000 words in this, in this book. And it's harder for us to, uh, you know, see the finer details like that. So the rule of thumb for also you aspiring writers is it takes 20 published books to make an income of 50,000 a year, which is why there's actually a group, a Facebook group and a, a Las Vegas event every year called 20 to 50. Yep. Um, and it's, so if you, if you publish 20 books, 20 books, that's a long time, by the way, to write 20 books, especially if you're George R. R. Martin, hint, um, to make 50,000. So uh, I think it's cool that I have eight books out and I'm, you know, uh, more than double that. In sales, mind you, you know, my publisher does take their cut, uh, of course, but I'm still very happy nonetheless. So that's my biggest accomplishment. And the biggest headache is just dealing with the not fun stuff like Facebook and, and Amazon, but especially Facebook. They're just soul sucking. They're liars, manipulators. They take your money. They say you got 10,000 impressions, but you got one sale out of it. You know, that part is just uh, it's uh, it's soul sucking is the best term or phrase. So besides ads, then, what would your top three marketing tips be for fellow authors? Have you found that's really worked for you? Unfortunately, Facebook is a necessity and there's a lot of tweaking, a lot of aggregate numbers that you have to dive into and figure out the, the minutia of what's working and what's not and why. I think one of the reasons I've been successful is everyone who reaches out to me, um, I respond. If they tag me on Facebook, the, the least I'll do is give them a like, you know, or a heart emoji or whatever it is to let them know I saw it. You know, I have 50 of them to go through, but hey, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Oh, you're awesome. You know, thank you so much. Um, if they message me, I take the time to respond to them because I remember what it was like whenever RC Bray talked to me, whenever uh, Kevin Hearn, I talked to him in person. You know, I remember like, oh, this is so cool. And, you know, it kind of builds a fan for life. So, I remember how it made me feel and I do the same thing for the people who reach out to me. I even go so far as that whenever Facebook tells me it's someone's birthday, I write happy birthday. And it's, it's really simple thing to do, but it's so funny to see some people be like, Oh my God, I'm fangirling right now. And I'm like, you're a guy. <laughs> you know, That's another thing I, I know that's been a cause of my success is interaction with my readers. Hell, so I hang out with some of them, you know, they'll come to Halloween parties or I'll do live events and, you know, I'll talk to them. And I think they're surprised to see that I'm just Hunter. You know, I'm just, I'm a dude, just, you know, a normal dude. And um, I'm very much down to earth. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I like it a lot. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah, Facebook, unfortunately, talking to, uh, oh, yeah, talking to readers. And then write. Write. 
you know, I have people reaching out to me who have one book out, which is impressive uh, to get to that point. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, but they're like, hey, you know, how can I be as successful as you? And I, I tell them that all of them the same thing, right. I didn't get noticed. I'd noticed an increase at book three, but book three is where it really takes off. That's where I really find my voice because book one was the first thing I ever wrote. And I wrote it for me. So I didn't anticipate anyone actually reading it. Book two, I knew people were going to read it. So it's refined and smooth and, and the references are not as obscured and people can enjoy it more. And then book three is where the series really takes off. But you got to write. People started noticing around book three and I got signed around book five. Um, but that's a lot of hard work. That is a lot of hard work. I had a full-time job as a regional manager for a conveyor company. Like I was going to these factories and selling conveyor screws and stuff. It was a fun job. Um, I had my nutrition store on the side. So every day when I wasn't traveling at 4.30, I would leave the office and then go to my store until eight o'clock at night. And I'd be writing at the same time while helping customers. And then on the weekends, I would also write while working at my store. Sunday was my only day off um, for a long time. And I'm talking 12 hour days plus, no, 13 hour days plus for years. And uh, it took time to get to the point where I am now, but right so Facebook ads, uh, actually Facebook's dying right now. So ads, uh, messaging readers, talking to your readers, and then uh, work, you gotta write. So what then has been your most memorable reader interaction moment? Recently, a, a very sweet lady reached out to me and uh, Uh, sorry, loss of fix me for obvious reasons. Her husband is uh, dying of cancer. <clears throat> I'm fine. And uh, she wanted to take an excerpt from book five called uh, My Red Balloon, where someone very important tells John a story about loss. And the story about loss, My Red Balloon, is, is actually on my YouTube. Uh, I wrote it for John on the way to his funeral and read it. <laughs> and I read it at his funeral. <sighs> so whenever she asked to read that at her husband's funeral, I don't think he's passed yet. I'm pretty sure he hasn't, but they said he's on his way. And she wanted to read that, have the pastor read that. And I can't even explain. <laughs> Isn't that amazing though, to know that? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing though, to know that? Obviously writing, it's so therapeutic for us as people as well, but when you're able to put something so raw on the page and then have somebody be in that same emotional state and take everything that you've written down and feel it so personally. That is everything. That's really yeah. amazing. I didn't, I didn't expect to react like that. That's crazy. I don't know. That kind of thing is, uh, it meant a lot. And I'm glad I could help her um, because this, this story is really touching. It's about a, it's about a child who has a, a red balloon that he was given. And it's a kid, right? So it's the most important thing in his life because he's a kid. He doesn't, you know, uh, so he has it tied around his wrist and he's out running and playing and having the time of his life like kids do. And then all of a sudden it, a wind blows, you know, it tugs it away. And then a, uh, uh, the personification of God comes down and basically tells him and the kids like, you know, can you please, can you get him? And he's like, you know, I can't, uh, he has to do what balloons must, which is fly. And the kid's like, but you know, it still hurts. And the illustration shows like a red ring around his wrist where it was. He's like, it hurts. It still feels like it's there. And man, and the hardest part, it was so hard at John's funeral because there's a part where the kid doesn't understand. Um, kids don't right we don't understand loss why people are taken away but uh when it says uh 
but I didn't get to say goodbye. Every time I watch that, it gets me. Because, you know, I had a phone call at, you know, eight in the morning saying that he had died in the night. So I never got to say goodbye. So anyway, yeah, the book is just, it's a short story and it, it, it means a lot. And I'm glad it helped someone else. Hmm. I'm gonna go do some push-ups and, <laughs> and drink some beer. <laughs> Chop down a tree or something, manly, build a fire. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your <laughs> YouTube channel, shall we? Um, which I find super intriguing because your setup is awesome. So <laughs> can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> let's do <laughs> so why did you start your youtube channel um so i originally started it um as a uh um for my nutrition store so it used to be like empire nutrition now it's hunter blaine author uh and then i noticed after being in the health industry since 2007 um Wow, long time. Mm. I just got more gray hairs. Uh, so I was in the health industry for a long time. Um, I worked as a regional manager for GNC. I worked as a regional manager for a supplement company. I started my own supplement company. Uh, it failed because I didn't know about insurance and how expensive that could be, uh, but I learned a lot from it. Then um, when I was still working at the supplement company, I would visit mom and pop stores like mine and I would be, and I would uh, uh, ask them questions. You know, how did you do this? How much did it cost? Why did you do it this way? And then, after, yeah, once again, I'm really good at and learning from uh, advice. So I took all the advice, and uh, I opened up my own store. And then, um, you know, while I had my own store, I also studied and got my pharmaceutical sales license, and I was able to legally go to doctors and talk to them about. Uh, different things uh, such as pharmaceuticals and even supplements because that's kind of a big deal if you give them advice and you're wrong that's 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 a big deal uh, legally speaking so you know uh, um, over the years I've helped I don't even know how many thousands of people you know with joint issues lose weight build muscle uh, cholesterol is a big one I've even helped men women with menopause um, you know that one that one was common um, and uh, I took all these common questions uh, and I put them on, um, on YouTube with different, you know, uh, one of them is, is a burger better, better than a salad. And, um, if you're traveling, um, uh, if you get ranch on your salad, you're actually better off eating a burger because a burger at least gives you protein and it doesn't have as much fat and sugar as ranch dressing. So, you know, one little packet at Chick-fil-A, you know, it was like 80 something grams of sugar or fat or, or both. I can't remember what it was, but I looked at it one time. I was like, oh my God. And then, you know, I never ate it again because that's just, that's how you put on fat. So the answer to the question is when, especially when you're traveling, is a burger better than the salad? Well, it depends on your dressing, but yeah. So, and then when's the best time to do cardio and all that stuff. So I started off doing it that way and I answered all my most common questions. Um, and then I started writing and I put out some stuff here and there. Uh, such as my red balloon. Um, and then I also, I thought I, I want to do like Twitch stuff for a while, um, which is like playing video games or, uh, or whatnot, which is why I have the setup. I have the lights, I have the ring light, I have the nice uh, camera, the microphone, you know, the whole setup. Um, and I was doing that. And uh, then I thought, uh, I came to the understanding like this is going to take as much time as I spent being an author to set up a Twitch thing and start from scratch. So instead I just took what I learned and applied it to the author thing, such as, you know, this interview right here. So, but I do have some videos up of me playing video games with some of my friends, like uh, Kirby, who's Nathaniel Locke in the series, Greg, who's Greg in the series. Um, so that's kind of cool that readers can see what the characters are actually like and how like, wow, he, he was pretty accurate, you know, for some of them. Um, and then here recently, I've been putting more funny videos of uh, uh, related to writing. Like one of them was, um, you know, uh, answering reader questions like, how can you kill your characters so easily? What kind of monster are you? And then the cut scene to me, uh, actually I actually have a Michael Myers mask. I don't know if you could see it. No, you can't. I have a Michael Myers mask that I put on and I had like the Dickies outfit. Then I was, you know, 
yeah, just funny stuff like that. So my YouTube's kind of all over the place. There's some gaming videos that are really funny that I spent a lot of time editing that helped me figure out my editing skills, um, which that's really time consuming. So God bless anyone who has to do that for a living. And then, you know, health advice and then some reader stuff. So that's, yeah, it's kind of what the, the channel's about. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I was going to say, as we're talking, I'm like, you're good at this stuff. So this <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I want to quickly too before we go to our rapid fire questions um I want to talk about your merchandise so when I was stalking your website um you have the best merchandise and one of the best is the iconic bit that you're obviously wearing uh on head to chest as well mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit about what sort of I mean, it's pretty iconic, so I guess we know what it came from but why you decided to make it into merchandise as well so um, uh, a fun fact, um, the reason why I did the beanie is because uh, uh, I actually had a gray beanie that I used to wear. And then one day John stole it and he sent me a text. I don't know if I can, uh, wait, I think I, yeah, there it is. So he sent me a text one day. And he said, uh, uh, the beanie's found a new home. It's doing well. Don't call the police. Something, something along those lines. And then he had it for years and years after that. So, um, and he wore it all the time. So that's why John in the books has a gray beanie. And then John also had like a black trench coat and other stuff like that. Um, and then uh, it was actually Shane who took the idea. He, so he took that picture, then, you know, just other pictures of John. That's him actually wearing real Freddy glove. That's a real metal Freddy glove he had commissioned. So jealous. Um, uh, anyway, so he had like the picture where John's doing that and he turned it, he had an artist turn it into an icon. And that was like the coolest and smartest things I think he could have done because it really does, you know, help identify my series. You know, just an example, I have a really awesome fan, uh, Rebecca. She makes me uh, some stickers that I actually give out for free uh, whenever someone buys a signed book. I just include that. And I also include some uh, plastic vampire teeth. They're they're over there somewhere, but they're like cheap, like the ones that kids wear, but I thought it was really funny. Fans seem to like it too. But yeah, so the merchandise, it's uh, it's the Beard of Beanie logo. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's definitely iconic. And I owe that all to Shane. I never would have thought to, you know, take a real picture of John and then change it up and then make it uh, into the symbol that it is. I love that. So then this is my favorite question to ask. What is the goal? What is the dream that you were changing? So my dream is to one day look at my wife who works very, 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 very hard. Um, she does a number of things. Um, I want to look at her and say, you don't have to work anymore. And um, that's one thing that really drives me. Um, also, I, I have to finish the series too. So you'd asked me earlier, like if I could ever, if I could branch off and do other ideas or anything. Now, other authors have asked me to co-author stuff with them. Um, and I said, even, even Shane, he wanted to do a series with me, um, like a sci-fi series or, or he, we were just kind of like initially just spitball and like, wouldn't it be cool? That kind of thing. And I said, I, I, I have to finish the series after I get these 13 books done, plus the, you know, 0.5 books after I get these 13 books done, uh, I'll, I'll think about other things, but I got to finish this series first, but I, I want to finish the series. And then I want my wife to never have to work again, um, which would be super awesome. Yeah. I love that girl and the movie and TV Well, the TV series. Oh yeah. Friends. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do have a segment called Speed Dating with the Author. So we are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I created ambience. <laughs> and basically what it is is five rapid questions. Are you ready? Yes. Amazing. What is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Clumsiest. Oh, okay. That's funny. I, uh, I just came to me like, I know. Um, so I have an email list. I send an email out once every two months or something. I should send more. I'm sure people sign up for my newsletter because they want to hear more. But um, I sent out the ebook to everyone who had not gotten it yet because uh, I had set that up later. And on BookFunnel, which is an 
uh, tool authors can use. There's a link where they have to put in the email address for them to download the book. And then there's a link where they could just click on the link and they get to download the book immediately. So I sent out an email to 3,500 people and was like, uh, for those of you who have not got it, here's the free ebook. And then there was no link. So I'd immediately send another one. Shit, here's the link. And it was the link that you need. And I said specifically, you don't need you to put your email address. I already have it, obviously. So I sent out the link that needed the email address. And I was like, shit. So then I sent the third email out within the span of like 10 minutes saying, I promise this is the last one. Here's the link. Please stay. And I got like, I don't know, like 10 unsubscribes or something, which I totally get. That would have been, that'd be annoying if Amazon sent me like three dumb emails like that in a row. So I was like, oh my God. I think a lot oh. of the readers would have loved that though. Like, especially if they've read your work, like that, yeah. I would have loved that. Hilarious. I'd be like, one of those days, huh, buddy? One of those days. <laughs> <laughs> what is the three words that would best describe you? Um, determined, unstoppable, and confident. What is your life motto? Um, that's a good one. I have a couple. Uh, is this is this family friendly or is this? It could be whatever late? you want it to be. It's your episode. So my, <laughs> my first one, dealing with uh, stress and so forth, such as getting a bill from the government saying you owe thousands of dollars because they messed up something. Um, you know, that's the helpless feeling, right? Or just dealing with these fr frustrations that just uh, that a lot of people could crumple under. Mm -hmm. My first bit of advice to most people is uh, fuck it. Yep. I worry about what I can control and everything else I can't control, I'll just deal with it. You know, I, I'll, I'll do what I got to do, but I'm not going to waste my time and energy on it. So fuck it. That's my first bit of advice. Second bit of advice, uh, this is my own personal saying, is uh, eat your charcoal and shit your diamonds. I so love that. I, I was the youngest RSD, uh, regional sales director at GNC. Um, I had the number one district, the entire company at Sears. Um, uh, you know, I'm already, I am jumped the gun on uh, being an author. You know, uh, uh, another author said I was, I jumped the ladder or something. Um, you know, all the authors so far I've talked to have been super supportive, which is really cool. We're all just a bunch of really cool people that want, that wants each other to succeed. Um, but, uh, do the hard work, do what you hate, which is go through the Facebook ads, go through the Amazon ads, figure out the aggregate, spend the time, you know, 13 hour days doing the grind, eat your charcoal. So later on you can pass your diamonds and all your work, hard work is paid off. Yeah. That's a really good motto. I like both of those mottos. Mm -hmm. What is the best song that describes you? Best song. See, I'm a, I was a musician. So was John. John was the most insane guitarist I've ever known. Um, there's actually a few videos of him. I posted somewhere, I think probably in my private group or something of him just shredding it up. Um, Man, I don't know on that one. There's too many songs that, that come to mind. I listen to mostly instrumental too. So that's the other thing is I don't really pay too much attention to lyrics, especially when I'm writing no lyrics, nothing that distracts, only instrumental. So um, what's, some of your, what's your favorite band? Let's see. That's, there's a bunch. Um, Mastodon comes to mind. Their new album is amazing. Um, I actually missed them Saturday. They came to town with Opeth, one of my second favorite, you know, also one of my favorite bands. And uh, I saw them live with John, I don't even know, 15 years ago or something when they came through town together. But I missed them this, uh, this time because I went to a, a, a Amanda's cousin, my wife's cousin's wedding. But, you know, family family's more important. They'll come back. So, um, but yeah, Mastodon, Opeth, uh, I listened to some death metal, I listened to some uh, orchestral stuff. So there, I don't know, there's just a bunch. Yeah, I love it. What is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? I don't know on that one. You do a lot of um, weights and stuff, don't you? Like heavy lifting and things like that, don't you? Not so much anymore. Um, 
I have degenerative disc disease. So my spine is slowly collapsing. So um, actually I did work out earlier. I have a home machine called a Max Pro, which is pretty, pretty cool considering I'm not in the gym anymore. Um, I do lightweight, but like 50 reps. So you can actually put on muscle and burn fat at the same time if you do lightweight and a lot of reps. Um, I did jujitsu for a while for a number of years, boxing, MMA, uh, wrestling, all at the same time under Travis Luter. That was a lot of fun. Um, oh, not a lot of people know about. Um, I, since John was so good at bass, eventually I stopped playing guitar and chose to be bass so I could be uh, in a band with him. So I'm actually a pretty mean bassist. Like I can shred it up, do sweep arpeggios, taps, uh, play lightning fast. So that's actually, yeah, that's something not a lot of people know about is I can shred it up on the six string bass. I have had so much fun, Hunter. Thank you so much for coming on today. Where do we, where do we find you? What's coming out? What to know? So um, hunterblain.com. So B-L-A-I-N, no E. Uh, that's a good place to go to. You can you can get the novella, which is twelve thousand words. Uh, you get the ebook for free by signing it for my newsletter. You just put in your email address, and then you immediately get to download the ebook. Um, there's also Audible, so you can go to audible.com or even Amazon.com since they're the same company. You can click on Audible uh, whenever you search my name, and the books are read by Luke Daniels, who does an incredible job, incredible job uh, of performing. And uh, all my books are available on Kindle Unlimited. So if you sign up for Kindle Unlimited, you know, I think it's like 10 bucks a month or something. Any author that's in there, you get to read for free or for the $10 a month, rather. You know, you can buy it, the Kindle, and I also have paperback. I, and I have signed versions, too. I have an entire bookshelf just uh, of books waiting to be signed. And so far, uh, uh, if you buy the signed books at the Argento website, you can also go to my website, hunterblaine.com, and then click on sign books, and it'll redirect you to the Argento website. But I, I include the fake vampire teeth or the plastic ones. Then I include these uh, actually really nice stickers that are uh, apparently approved for both your car and uh, can also fit uh, or survive the dishwasher too. So actually, I'm going to slap one right here here in a minute. But um, yeah, that's where you can find it. So Audible, Am Amazon mostly, and hunterblaine.com. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been amazing. Yeah, no, thank you. I've never freaking cried before in, a, in an interview. Like I'm, I don't cry very much in general, but obviously, you know, dealing with a, a loss is a is a is a really strong topic, and uh, mm -hmm. draws an emotional response. And especially since it was it was just a couple of weeks ago, you know, where she asked for 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 the copy of that to uh, you know to read, so that it was still kind of fresh in my mind, mm -hmm. uh, and just how touching. And also, you know, it's my greatest fear. I already lost John. So if I lost my wife too, like those are my two biggest best friends and people who shaped my life. If I lost her too, like I can just, I can really empathize with like how terrifying and, and painful that must be. So if I can help someone, you know, be a little, make it easier for them. I, I have no problem. I, I'll do it all day long. Yeah. So yeah. like, I've never, you know, done this in an interview. So it's a, I don't know, it's pretty cool. I, you know, I don't mind. I'm, I'm a manly man and all that stuff, but I'm also comfortable with who I am and obviously death is is affects everyone so yeah no, this has been a crazy interview I wasn't expecting it good questions <laughs> you, you clearly did your research too which is uh, really great um you know a lot of interviews you could tell that they're they have a checklist and they're waiting to go to the next person and get a month's worth of content in a day that kind of thing so now I appreciate uh, all the work that you've done amazing thank you um and yeah who knows maybe watch this space maybe next year we'll be able to get you on again as well Heck yeah, anytime, anytime. Well, have a good day, Hunter. I'm going to love you and leave you, but uh, stay in touch. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.